Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, just while uh, a few of you are logging in, I can see a few people are joining us. What I'll do is just give a really brief introduction to uh, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld. Most of you know who he is and about his work, but um, just to give us a few minutes at the start, just so everyone can get in on time. So as most of you know, uh, Brad's an Associate Professor of Exercise Science at Lehman College, which is in the Bronx in New York. And he's also the Director of Human Performance and the Fitness Program. Uh, he's well known for his uh, publishing career. He's published over 250, I think, uh, peer-reviewed scientific papers on various exercise and sports and nutrition topics. Uh, he also has authored the, the seminal textbook. Uh, it's the second edition now of Science and Development of Muscle Hypertrophy, which um, I keep seeing as being uh, translated into multiple different languages and it has gone uh, across the globe as uh, one of the biggest textbooks uh, in our field. Uh, most of you probably follow Brad on social media. I'm just saying off, off air, I, I wasn't quite sure uh, what continent or country he was going to be in or what time zone. So I'm uh, glad we uh, managed to uh, carve out some time to make this happen. So for those of you who haven't been on one of these Q&As before, uh, this is like one of the previous ones where I'll be asking your questions to one of the experts who contributed to Advanced Personal Training, which was a textbook I wrote uh, last year. In this case, Brad co-authored the evidence-based practice chapter with uh, Dr. Anoop uh, Balahandran, and I'm really grateful that he uh, also um, took time out of his busy schedule to, to co-edit some of the uh, content, some of the chapters in the book. Uh, so without further ado, what we'll do, we'll get into the questions, and, and this uh, webinar is about um, the evidence-based practice, which has become somewhat of a buzzword in the fitness industry. And this is why I was really keen to um, include it as a chapter uh, right from the offset in the, in the textbook. And uh, Brad and Anouk did a really great job in doing that. So if it's okay, Brad, I'll, um, I'll just fire into the questions if that's all right. Sure, and I do wanna give a big shout out to Anoop, uh, who is a central part of the, uh, the chapter in the book and just uh, someone I, I really consider to be a true evidence-based uh, practitioner and, and a very good researcher as well. Yeah, yeah, I second that. It was, um, I, I, as well as um, sort of commissioning, I was really enjoyed sort of reading it as well. I learned a lot myself from it. Um, and uh, hopefully um, people in the audience as well uh, who are on this call did too. Uh, so let's go to, the, um, to our first question. That, and these questions have come in to me uh, via email or some on social media. Um, I have filtered out a lot of the training questions because this webinar is specifically on uh, evidence-based practice. Uh, so I'll start with um, a really short and concise one from Sean. And his question is, um, when did you first become aware of evidence-based practice? Um, so I, I, I kind of had an idea without knowing the term evidence-based practice, um, I, probably at the turn of the century, you know, right around 2000, I started to uh, understand that there was a bridge between science and practice, and that had always been the NSCA, National Strength and Conditioning Association. Uh, their mission statement was to bridge the gap between science and practice, but I never really understood the, the genesis of it and the uh, integration of it until I went to my PhD, which was 2010. So uh, there was a book uh, by Portnoy and Watkins, uh, specifically on evidence-based practice. The first semester of my PhD uh, was we had an evidence-based practice course. And uh, that's when I really under was shown to understand what the true evidence-based practice is. So that uh, before that, I kind of, it was just kind of a feel that, yeah, there was something out there where I would, take research and apply it for, for practical purposes. But the uh, the integrated aspect and, and the true definition and how you go about becoming an evidence-based practitioner did not become apparent to me, uh, I would say, until uh, until I read the Portney and Watkins book, until I had my first course in my PhD. Oh, cool. Um, I, I think that's a similar to experience to a lot of people that did their undergrads a few years ago, maybe even still now, is that um, you kind of, you're, 
doing evidence-based practice but you don't know kind of the the mechanics of it and, and the actual process and I, I certainly didn't know the history of it so it was really interesting to, to read your chapter seeing where it stemmed from and how it's kind of been applied uh, in the fitness industry so that was, you, you included some really nice examples as well in the chapter as uh, about sort of um, how decisions in the medical uh, field were often based on um, experience and intuition which quite surprised me um because it's a relatively new concept isn't it it's not actually that old yeah this bloodletting was uh where they they would uh practice physicians would practice bloodletting as a method of healing as a method of treatment where we know that is not a uh an evidence-based way yeah. to, to go about pra uh, practicing you know yeah, and for any uh, people that are really interested in the sort of some of the history of it, is there, I think there's a good book by Ben Goldacre um, called Bad Science, and he kind of goes into some of those sort of early practices, which you look back at them and you see they seem crazy, but um, at the time that was just kind of yeah the, the standard way of uh, of doing things. Okay, um, I'll go on to the next question, which comes from Danny, uh, and he says, uh, I understand the importance of using research to guide practice, but what advice would you give to a personal trainer who finds it difficult to keep up with the research? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and, and I think many, it's not only the ability to keep up with it, but I think also there are people who just don't have the background to really delve into the literature. Uh, in that case, or in those cases, I think the best advice I can give is to follow a group, not just one, but follow different evidence-based practitioners and see what you're getting consensus-wise. So kind of like when you look to literature, we always want to get a consensus. One study can be out here and, and give you a very skewed picture as to what the overall literature shows. Generally speaking, if uh, there's some really good colleagues of mine, if you actually, in in the book, uh, the book we edited, uh, many of them are people that I would highly recommend, or pretty much all of them. So if you follow people like that, uh, and I don't want to throw out names and just look at the book because I'll then people say I'm leaving out someone. So, yeah, sure. but if you look at the book, you'll find a lot of them, and there are others too that certainly that weren't in our book. But if you follow a good number of them and, and look to get uh, each one's opinions, which is an educated opinion, uh, you can then come to your own conclusions. You try to see commonalities. Remember that just looking at one person, an appeal to authority is low on the hierarchy of evidence. Your ultimate hierarchy of evidence is the, uh, is the scientific method, uh, which is an objective systematic way of, of looking at a topic. But um, the people who are evidence-based generally have a good sense of that. And I think most, if you look at my opinion on many things, it's going to be quite consistent with those of my colleagues. So, And um, also fairly recently, maybe over the last decade or so, there's been a lot of um, research reviews. Um, I talked about this with Alan when he was on. Yeah. Uh, he was probably one of the first to come up with that concept of reviewing the research, albeit it's done through kind of the eyes of that person, but if they're a credible source, um, those are a really good resource that kind of weren't around um, 15, 20 years ago. Totally agree. And and yes, and Alan, a very good friend of mine, as well as a colleague, a collaborator on papers. Uh, as far as I know, he was the, uh, the original gangster. Yeah. Uh, uh, so basically the OG of... Uh, of research reviews, but there's some very good other ones now too. Uh, the mass uh, publication is terrific, I think, as is James Krieger, another colleague of mine has a weightology. Uh, so yeah, uh, Allen's is more focused nutritionally. Um, some of the others are more training. So yeah, you, I would certainly say that's a great place to get uh, good evidence-based information. And um, also one of the things that's um, become a lot more easily accessible uh, a free open access papers as well like you, you've done a lot of good reviews that uh, I always say to students to get a broad overview of a, a topic have a search on PubMed for reviews systematic reviews and it gives you a kind of an overview before you kind of go into individual studies um, so your yeah a lot of your papers do that really brilliantly I think um, one of your 
your 2010 um, review of mechanisms of hypertrophy. That's probably one of the most, when I was marking personal training work was probably the most cited. So uh, that, that's always a good starting point. Yeah, but you got to be careful there too, because yes, that was actually a, my master's project or it came out of my master's project. And I, I love that paper. It basically was what uh, set me off on my journey. But what I would say is, is that that is quite dated now. Uh, so years that, old, right? what's that? Yeah, 12 years old, is it now? It's 12 years. Well, it's actually more. So it was published 12 years ago, but it takes a while to get published. So it actually, I think was 2009 was when it actually got accepted. And bottom line is I collaborated on a follow-up paper a few years now. That's, that's even getting somewhat older, but I'd say that's certainly much more up to date. Uh, with uh, colleagues Henning Walker Hodge, sure. uh, Jua Homi, uh, and a couple other really good uh, researchers, and it was called Sense Stimuli and Sensors of Hypertrophy, something like that. But anyway, it, it basically updated. So the review papers, basically, research keeps moving forward. So you got to be careful on the review papers that you're keeping up with newer information that doesn't leave out uh, what has what the emerging evidence is. I think, yeah, that, that raises a really good point, actually, is that um, looking for updates, because I have I was asked that a few times by um, some friends is like, well, you've already written a, a book. Is it just the same version? I'm like, well, no, that's that's why you've got to write updates, because, you know, you we're presented with new data and new research. So um, I suppose that's that's a, a tenant of evidence based practice is that you don't just sort of have a line in the stand and say that's the way it is you've got to constantly look at the literature and be willing to change your opinion on it i guess yeah i think it's a, that's a great point and really important to understand that the strength of evidence exists on a continuum so we can have very weak evidence and we can have very strong evidence or we have almost basically there might be no studies on a given topic in which sense you have to move down your hierarchy and you start uh, you revert to logical reasoning and other lower forms of evidence. But let's say you have one or two studies on the topic and they might have a lot of limitations. You're going to make uh, determinations based on the evidence you have, but your confidence in those conclusions are weak. And as more evidence accumulates and you're able to get certainly not only more studies, but hopefully better studies that are uh, more, uh, the quality of the study is, is better. Uh, you can draw stronger and stronger conclusions and you're, you then, I'll give a, for instance, um, the topic of load for hypertrophy. Um, 10 years ago, we were basing it on the uh, most, the theory was, is that heavy loads were necessary for hypertrophy, but we didn't have a lot of evidence. And a lot of the evidence that we had was based on tangential uh, research on like the hormone hypothesis. Um, and on um, uh, EMG evidence on recruitment patterns. As we've gotten more and more longitudinal evidence, long-term studies on hypertrophy, we've now been able to show, and I think quite conclusively, that uh, low load training and high load training, at least on a whole muscle level, are very similar in hypertrophy. And I don't think no matter, we've had so much evidence now that basically we can have that as a very strong conclusion. Like it would be very difficult for me to fathom that uh, other evidence would come in and suddenly change that. But there's plenty of other evidence where at this point, if you're asking me, I my confidence is quite uh, unsure. We, I think it, I'd say we have weak evidence, but we can only go by what the evidence we have. We, we need to form an opinion. Uh, it's, you don't want to just say, well, I have no opinion. I don't know. I don't know what to do. You want to, you get, you, you, in practice, you want to guide practice in some way. So you try to use the evidence that you have. And then within that, look to your own uh, knowledge and, and the strength of that evidence to come to a conclusion. Yeah, I, 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 um, as well, I'd encourage people. I think you posted it uh, maybe last week or a couple of weeks ago was um, sort of how to distinguish between someone that's practicing evidence-based practice and maybe someone that's a bit more on the pseudoscience side of things mm -hmm. and the level of certainty. And I always say this to students is that when you speak with people like yourself and experts in different fields is that there's usually always caveats and sort of uh, cautionary words like speculative and things like that, rather than yeah, 
anything being definitive, which I know that kind of can frustrate some people that want straight answers. But um, that is, I, I kind of agree with that as a sort of a heuristic. If you're looking to find an expert, they're usually quite cautious in their recommendations like you were just then. Yeah, uh, the most knowledgeable people generally reflect uncertainty in their uh, conclusions. Now, again, it there are certain things I would say, if you ask me about light load versus heavy load training, I would speak with a good deal of confidence because I think the evidence is that strong. But in applied science, generally, there are very few topics that I would be uh, that confident in. Yeah, for sure. Uh, cool. Uh, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, this question is from uh, Sky. Uh, he writes, um, or he or she, sorry, your uh, evidence-based practice chapter makes complete sense to me. I'm aware of a couple of successful trainers who use methods which aren't supported with scientific evidence, but they achieve great results with their clients. And their clients are obviously pleased with these. Why would a trainer change to an evidence-based practice approach if what they are doing is working well? Well, it's simple. Define what working well means. So I could say something's working. I'm gaining muscle. Does that not does that necessarily mean that I might not be gaining more muscle if I did something different? So to, to say that something works is subjective and not does not necessarily reflect optimal gains or optimal results. So uh, what I would say is, is that when you're able to at least base uh, your thinking on what we know ob objectively, because by the way, when people are saying it's working, it's subject, there's no, ob ob or there's, the objectivity is in question. It's usually a subjective. Yeah, I think it's, you look like you're gaining muscle. Or I, how are they defining, how are they determining that? So when we can actually objectively assess the topic through research, at the very least, you want to base your knowledge on that. It doesn't mean you have to necessarily do what, and that's the uh, essence of evidence-based practice as we discuss in the book. You're not necessarily deferring to research, but you're at least using it as a guideline. Uh, and I think those that don't do that are not only missing the boat, but they are leaving their um, leaving their results to chance that they just don't know that they might be getting better results. So uh, it can never hurt to have a, uh, a basic understanding or, or even more of a basic, just a good understanding of uh, what the evidence, what the objective evidence shows. And then you're always gonna have to defer to your own, that's, as I mentioned, um, evidence-based practice defers to your, ultimately to your own expertise in combination with the needs and abilities of the individual. And would you say it's quite, um, this is why often um, debates and on social media uh, aren't very fruitful because you get certain people uh, that have their sort of identities captured within a particular method, whether that be training or nutrition. Um, so it's very difficult to, like if you're just kind of asking them to follow an approach and throw in citations at them, um, that might take, it's probably not going to be very effective because they're so bought in to a particular idea. So it, sometimes it's a, a case of not trying to change people's opinions in, in some cases, because it can be um, a bit of a waste of time. Yeah, I, I mean, someone obviously has to be open to uh, to learning. If someone's not open to learning, then uh, and that's there's um, there's theory, psychological theory. There's a uh, hierarchy um, of uh, states of change. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but anyway, this is a basic uh, tenet of psychology. And if someone is at a stage of change where they're not open to the change basically say, all right, when you're ready, you can come back. So someone to actually, uh, uh, to bring about change, someone has to be ready and willing to change. So yeah, I don't try to convince someone who'd say, you know what, I think, uh, I think evidence-based practice is crap and don't, don't bother me with it. 
That's the, yeah, it's, it's, the it's an interesting one. That um, sort of stages of change. Uh, that's actually covered in the um, um, one of the chapters on on behaviour change or helping to clients to change. Yeah. And um, yeah, sometimes it, it's a very well. It's a very difficult. It's a subject in itself, um, a, a sub discipline of psychology, and it's it's quite a difficult thing. And I, I don't think uh, you know if someone, particularly if someone's had success with a particular method. Um, that's going to take a long time maybe for them to look into change and if the, if they want to yeah depending on sort of what stage they're at as you mentioned uh, okay I'll go on to the the next one um, this is from Mohammed and he asks uh, in your opinion what is the most common misconception about evidence-based practice in the fitness industry yeah uh, it kind of goes to what I was just saying, the I would say without a doubt, the most common misperception is that people think evidence-based practice is just deferring to research. So saying that I'm going to base, you know, everything that I'm doing is going to be guided. I, I, I want to uh, use my terms carefully now, is going to be based on research, that research is going to tell me what to do in essence. When research is just a guiding force, research can never tell anyone what to do. Uh, when I carry out a study, let's say on muscle growth, people are getting all different responses to the same routine. Now, there will be a clustering where the majority will be getting similar results, but there's also going to be people at the outer regions of you know, the higher end and the lower end. Some people might be getting no results and some people might be gaining 25% uh, muscle and you know, in, on a given routine, and then you have another clustering in the, in the middle there. So again, research is going to get you the means. It'll get you insights into what a majority will respond to on average within a given population. But uh, you never will just defer to research. You always need to use your expertise. Um, there are many gaps in the literature. Uh, there is many limitations of individual studies. Uh, so that always has to be taken into account when you are coming up with a with programming when you're using evidence-based practice to program for fitness uh it's just going to be guided and i think that is to me a better way to um to explain it it's a research guided uh practice so it's, it's kind of like research is um is it's pointing you in the right direction so to speak but it's not giving you like a google map precise <laughs> directions of where to go exactly research research isn't going to tell you you should be doing 10 sets a week uh you know six to 12 reps that's not the way it works uh and and by the way uh research generally most because of the applied aspect their uh, programming is not an either or choice so it's not do this do that you yeah. can do different combinations where research generally is is set up to be binary, is to look at this versus this. So research is not going to tell you how can you combine these things potentially to get better results. So again, you have to understand the limitations of research, and that's what the true evidence-based practitioner does. So not basically following like one of the three tenants, not just going to one extreme. So the previous example was maybe a trainer that's just going off their experience, which might be good experience, and then the other extreme to that is someone that's on PubMed, Google Scholar, and and looking for an for an answer where you know it doesn't really work like that. It just it kind of we use the uh, analogy of um, you know pieces in a puzzle, and like each time we get a study, it just adds to 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 the picture, but it doesn't kind of tell us what to do. Um, I, I wanted to ask you on on that when you mentioned the evidence hierarchy, when we uh, which is this conceptual model included in the book where we have quality of evidence which is staged and we often see um, meta-analysis with systematic reviews at the top um, anecdotes and opinion at the bottom in your opinion do you think one of the misconceptions about evidence-based practice is that that static in that people often think that if it's an rct a randomized control trial that is the be all and end all when in actual fact you can get bad rcts and you can get potentially expert opinion in some cases, which might supersede an RCT. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, the quality of studies um, can vary widely. Uh, and particularly now that we have, uh, I don't want to 
go down the rabbit hole, but uh, there's pay for play now with the uh, journals are popping up where they basically will accept anything if you pay their access fee, or almost anything. And the quality of peer reviews is getting worse because of the, there's just so many journals that good reviewers are getting inundated and don't want to review you. They basically don't have time to review all these. So they're getting poor peer review. Uh, there's poor papers are getting through. And yeah, uh, just because it's published in a peer reviewed journal does not necessarily mean it is a quality study. And even quality studies have uh, can have large limitations to them. So uh, expert opinion uh, can be certainly a very good source. Like I mentioned, if you go to uh, some of the research reviews, those are expert opinions. They can be very good sources of knowledge, but they're, they're based on, it, it's kind of their chicken or the egg. The, the uh, researchers there are basing their opinion on good quality studies. So you have to have the good quality studies to have experts being able to come up with opinions that are um, trustworthy. If, sure. if you don't have good research, the expert opinion doesn't mean much because then it's all based on their own anecdote. So yeah, there, it is an interplay between the two. And the, the other thing you did nicely, you and Anoop in the book is um, provide a, a framework for, a basic framework for appraising the quality of a study and how applicable it is to answering your question. Because um, on the surface, it seems quite easy, the way papers are all structured, particularly abstracts, you know, you can quite easily decipher what's gone on and refer to a conclusion. But um, in terms of actually assessing the quality of that study, it's quite, quite well, it's a very difficult thing to do to appraise literature. So you prevent, presented um, a nice framework to do that. And um, do you just want to kind of summarize a, a, a process you might take um, when you're looking at a paper? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um... First of all, you have to have a good insight into, into research. So I think, uh, you know, a lot of people in the field are sh somewhat shorthanded because if you don't, if you're just reading research studies and have never been involved in them, uh, it is hard to really understand the processes, which is why, you know, I, uh, I'm graduate pro program director of our master's program. I encourage all of my students, uh, they don't have to, but the vast majority uh, participate as research assistants in, in our studies that we're carrying out and they just get so much out of it. So it, it is, you're, you're working at a deficit, but you can certainly learn a lot if you just read a lot. And um, a couple of things that I think are very important. Number one, you go through the methods and see if they are reproducible. Are you? Try to read with an eye towards, if I'm going to carry out this study, would I be able to use this, the method section, and carry out this study? It should read like a recipe. So if, if a recipe just says, um, add sugar, well, how much sugar do I add? You know, like, add, so you, you need more, um, you need to really have an understanding within the method section of the uh, paper as to exactly what was done. If not, it's leaving you with a lot of questions as to what whether the methods were sound or not. If you can't know exactly how the, the study was carried out, you're going to question, was the study designed properly? Um, you know, if a study is talking about, we well, we did squats. Well, did the squats go to parallel, below parallel, above parallel? Were they done to failure, not to failure? I mean, there's so many other questions you have, and you really need to, to read for that. Uh, statistical analysis, uh, very important to at least have a basic understanding of statistics. I've seen some really bad statistical analyses that give a very, that give a false picture of uh, the interpretation of the results. Uh, another very important thing to do is look at the sample size, how many uh, subjects are included. Uh, generally speaking, you're going to do what's called a power analysis, which uh, is done to give you an estimate of how many subjects are needed to uh, adequately carry out the study and draw conclusions from it. But uh, some of the power analyses, again, just are not based, they, they are not actually well done power analyses and they, they pass through peer review. Um, so you have to have a decent understanding of that. And by the way, if studies are underpowered, 
you can get false net. It's much easier to see a false negative where there might be important uh, uh, insights into the study that were not shown because of the low statistical power. Um, one thing I do want to also mention here is that uh, I think there is a big over-reliance uh, and, and one of my hobby horses is to do away with this on focusing on statistically significant findings. So it's called null hypothesis statistical testing, NHST, which is basically, I, and I don't want to, again, go down that rabbit hole too much here, but I think it's very important where uh, the overwhelming number of studies at this point use a use this no hypothesis testing where they have point they use a 0.05 uh, a priori p value as a cutoff point so anything below 0.05 is considered significant 0.05 and above is considered uh, not significant that does not mean significant and not significant in this context has nothing to do or not necessarily have anything to do with the practical meaningfulness of results. And I think uh, what's gonna be very important uh, going forward and all the studies that are carried out in my lab now shun the null hypothesis testing. We do all our statistics based on uh, point estimates. So what is the magnitude of the effect and what are the confidence intervals around that? Sure. So a topic, I think that's beyond the scope of where we want to go here, but I think it's very important. If you sure, I, I think you actually, uh, that's briefly mentioned um, in the, in your chapter, um, the area of statistics, which again, like behavior change is a discipline in itself. And just your um, sort of summary there of uh, what to look out for, or what how you navigate a paper sort of demonstrates the complexity of, of a pra uh, uh, praising evidence and um, so I'm based at Oxford Brooks down the road. There's a, a slightly more famous university, University of Oxford, and they actually do a whole course dedicated to uh, evidence-based uh, medicine, evidence-based practice. And these are the type of things that those courses are going into. And by the way, there's, there's disagreement as well, isn't there, amongst academics about the best practices of sort of um randomization approaches and statistical analysis so it's um it it gets a bit of a minefield if you kind of really want to go deep into it doesn't it completely agree and, and yeah and, and just to wrap up it is very to me very important that uh people do have a basic understanding of looking beyond the 0.05 and trying to get into the heart of what what findings were shown and looking at the magnitude of the effect how big was the effect or small uh, and that really is going to guide you because we care about the meaningfulness much more than we do if something, uh, if a value approaches a probabilistic, you know, frequent, what's called frequentist uh, statistics, where um, I'd say you, you can say that this 0 .04, uh, 0 0.049 is a significant finding, but 0.052 is not. It's just that gives you no insight into is this something that would be beneficial for, for carrying out in practice? Is, you know, is higher volume better than lower volume? Is uh, higher reps better than lower reps, or et cetera? And that's um, so, so something, just before we go on to the next question as well, uh, a, statistic, a statistical component um, in, in an effort to sort of make research a lot more accessible and sort of by size, we often see uh, infographics and things which, Kind of do boil down the conclusion to the p-value basically which is was there a significant effect or not and that's i suppose how a lot of um misconceptions can can spread if, if one study has shown something which maybe doesn't support the body of research that can quickly get spread around and become sort of a fact or or make things a bit more confusing yeah, and I, I think the uh, real or one of the it's a bunch of issues around that, but a real issue for the general public is the term significant is used. And for most people, if you hear it is significant, the findings were significant, that means that's a magnitude effect that, wow, that means that's a big effect. When you can have very tiny effects that are statistically significant and you can have very large eff uh, effects that are not statistically significant based on various probabilistic aspects, including sample size. So uh, the general public is uh, is at a disadvantage because most have not had statistical coursework. And it is something, if you want to be an evidence-based practitioner, you have to at least have insights into these nuances. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, and that's before we go on to sort of reliability statistics and and other approaches um, that are used in the literature. Um, but we won't. That's a that's a separate podcast or um, webinar. I'll go on to Gurdeep's question, and he's put in your chapter. You discuss how evidence based practice is a combination of using evidence and your own experience. Uh, do you think some trainers are becoming too focused on scientific evidence and not trusting their personal experiences? I thought that was a really interesting question. Yeah, I do. Uh, I just as much as I think some uh, trainers don't or shun science. I think there's a polarity and both of them are missing the boat. So, yeah, um, I think that people because they embrace this, they hear about evidence based practice and they don't grasp the nuances, they will look to like a uh, positions like we wrote a position stand recently and we give guidelines and they consider these like the Moses handing down the Ten Commandments of hypertrophy, which is that's not the way it works. So yeah, you need to use not only your expertise, but you have to consider the individual. People respond differently to different uh, stimuli and, and different variables. And, and there's lifestyle factors are going to come into play there, sleep practices, nutritional practices, of course, genetics will always uh, be involved, et cetera. And uh, you have to use your own expertise, but then also look at who am I dealing with? Am I dealing with a hard gainer who might need a different routine than someone who gains muscle easily or et cetera? So yeah, it's, I think that's an astute question and, and something that uh, unfortunately when uh, I think evidence-based practice is a fascinating area, and I think it's something that everyone needs to know, but I think it's been uh, misapplied. Sure, I, I completely agree. And, and going back to the sort of the genesis of uh, evidence-based practice, it came from ev evidence-based medicine, and it was um, instead of client preferences, it was sort of patient preferences. So even though medically, for instance, the doctor might be aware of what they think is best for the patient, it's not just a case of broadly applying that and, and inflicting that on the patient. Um, it's the same with evidence-based practice in that you might have uh, good evidence for your training or nutrition prescription for a particular client, but ultimately you have to consider their preferences as well, because ultimately, like you mentioned, um, behavior change is a massive part of things. You know, you can have all the evidence behind a certain intervention, but if the client uh, you know they're not going to adhere to it or um, be uh, particularly receptive to it, then you need to take that into account, right? Absolutely. Yeah, um, so that's that's I, something that um, came up recently, actually, in another um, discussion I had with um, Mike Matthews when we discussed high-intensity interval training, which was very popular and still is. Um, and I've seen a lot of trainers prescribe it um, to, to clients but it's not always you know the some people don't get on with it and the kind of literature shows that that it's not everyone's cup of tea so preferences is a really important one yeah cool okay um next one is from uh nikki uh and this is another interesting one it's uh, are there any methods in your experience that don't correspond with the current research for example, have you seen good results from a style of training that research suggests is less effective than another method? Yeah. Um, so, first of all, you have to have an objective measure to say if something is working or not. I can, you know, what is your yardstick to say that if something's working, something else might not be working better? So, here's what I would say to that. There are many aspects, as I did talk about earlier, where the strength of evidence is weak. And in that case, yeah, I, I mean, I think there are things that might be suggested in the literature, but we have weak evidence on it that I would say, you know what, my intuition based on what I'm seeing in the field is that it is working and we just don't have enough good evidence to really show that it does. When things are, are more concrete in terms of the evidence, the research behind it, uh, no, because I don't think that my anecdotal opinion, which would be subjective, would trump that. I could say, you know what, I still think heavier road training is building more muscle. Well, if you're not carrying out, and I'm not saying I do think that, I'm just throwing out a hypothetical. Yeah. 
if someone is thinking that, what is their, how are they measuring it? We're, we're using, like when we're doing these studies, we're using ultrasound and MRI and, and these very sophisticated methods. They might be using the mirror and saying, you know what? Yeah, they're, they're getting jacked. Well, how do you, you're not doing that in a controlled fashion. So um, yeah, I, I think there are things certainly in the literature that are, that have weak evidence, but you could say, you know what? The evidence at this point is showing that, you know, supersets are not effective. I think that in my experience, supersets might be effective under certain circumstances that just haven't been shown in the research, that the evidence that we have has not properly brought out that the favorability in the context that, in the context of how it's been studied. So hopefully that answers her question. It, it doesn't, um, just, just a quick one, you briefly mentioned there about sort of outcome measures. And I, I think this is something you and Anoop cover in uh, your chapter as well, is that when you're looking at a study, um, the actual outcome measures, are they um, sort of surrogate measures or right, right. the actual outcome of interest? And do you just want to kind of um, tell uh, listeners what, what the difference is there? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's like, a, a, again, there's so many things when you're looking at a study that I would talk about as far as the quality. But let's say you're uh, looking at muscle mass and you want to see the change in muscle mass. I mean, you could use skin folds and get body fat. And then there's a formula where you can then look at their quote unquote lean mass and use that as a surrogate for muscle growth. Well, is that really muscle growth? No, it's not telling you because it's everything except fat mass. Basically your lean mass is looking at everything except fat mass. And that could be water. Uh, you, you can have changes in water. And there's also, by the way, error rates, higher error rates in a uh, in a measure like that. Whereas if I'm using, let's say MRI, which is a gold standard for hypertrophy, you're actually seeing the muscle and you're measuring the actual change in the muscle. Um, so yeah, the, the measurement, uh, outcome, the way you're measuring the outcome is always going to be an important, uh, consideration in terms of the quote unquote quality of the study. And in terms of the, the conclusions that you can derive, uh, based upon what the outcomes are. And a, another good example might be, um, uh, muscle protein synthesis and muscle growth, because you often see that Absolutely. kind of cited about how a particular supplement or way of feeding training program increased mps but Correct. ultimately most people are interested in if the actual whole muscle has increased in size correct and actually and to your point uh, there's been studies that show that uh, particularly in untrained subjects the uh, and i think depending on the routine probably in trained subjects as well the time course of uh, muscle protein synthesis does not match the uh, longitudinal increases in muscle growth. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm just going to add in um, uh, kind of an offset from that question, which is, um, are there, is there any research? I think I might know what you're going to say, but uh, I'll ask anyway. Uh, do you have any examples where research has made you change your mind on a particular topic? Tons. I, I mean, I mentioned certainly the high reps, low reps. That's I did a 180 on that because I used to be of the opinion that if you did anything more than like 15 reps, it was glorified cardio and that you wouldn't gain muscle. But yeah, I mean, just from a hypertrophy standpoint, so, I, so many things. I mean, nutrient timing is a big one where I uh, was very entrenched in the thought that you had to slam a shake within a half hour, 45 minutes of your training session, you go straight catabolic. Research is quite clear that that's not the case. Um, I had been a proponent of fasted cardio and the literature has now shown that that probably is, has little effect on body fat loss. Um, I was a proponent of short rest intervals because of what is called the hormone hypothesis. And I was a believer, by the way, in the hormone hypothesis that your goal should be to get your uh, acute hormone uh, basically post-exercise there, you, you can train in a certain way to spike testosterone and growth hormone. And the literature really does not show that that, uh, that has much of an effect on muscle growth, if any. And similarly, it was shown because training with short rest intervals tended to jack up those hormone levels. I was a proponent of these short rest intervals and, and I could go on and on, but yeah, I, I would say probably more often than not, 
uh, my opinions have at least gone somewhere to the other side. You know, I've changed at least to a certain degree, and in certain cases, they've done 180. So yeah, uh, science has really uh, opened up my eyes to. Um, it's, it's fascinating, and it's opened up my eyes to uh, being very open. I, I would actually, I think, a very important uh, point is that there's nothing wrong with admitting you're wrong. And in fact, it is, to me, it's a badge of courage because the true scientist doesn't care about trying to prove themselves right, like being hard and all right, this is what I thought. So I'm going to be looked at as like this idiot if, if somehow I now change my opinion. To the contrary, if you change your opinion based on emerging evidence, you should be uh, championed uh, because that that uh, infers that you actually are a true scientist because all you care about is getting it right, not not being right. That's a re really good point about the um, sort of ha having humility and being able to change your mind. I remember when um, the book first came out, um, someone, um, not maliciously, but they kind of sent me an extract from the first edition and something I'd written and then something in the second edition, which was kind of contradictory. So, and that's because more uh, evidence over the last four or five years had, had emerged. And it was, this person kind of saw it as a, why are you, you know, how can we trust this? But it's kind of like, well, that's that's why you have updates because otherwise that, you know, we'd, we'd write one book and that would be it. And like similar to your book, I'm sure things yeah. things changed in, in the second volume of your book. And that's probably something that students and trainers should look out for is, is people that are um, willing to change their mind and have good reasons for doing that as well. Yeah, and look, there's certain like in certain basic physiology, there's not much that changes there. That uh, you you look at the basic physiology textbooks. I mean, there's even some things there, but a lot of what we have known is is can be hardened over the years. We start to get very strong evidence. We're at a certain point that doesn't change. When you're talking practical, uh, various practical things, then yeah, there's. Uh, is huge changes that happen uh, in cer certain cases, at least, because we have weak evidence. You, you, things change when the evidence is not that strong. Once you start getting strong evidence, at some point, evidence becomes quite strong. And then that particular topic, you don't need to revisit because sure. it, there's just enough evidence where we, we have good confidence. But most in applied sciences, I'd say most of the things that we're looking at have somewhat weak to moderate at best evidence. Yeah, and then just quickly going back on a, a point previously about sort of trying to decipher good information from maybe not so reliable information. If if someone is um, really tied into a particular method or supplement or nutritional method and their sort of whole identity is in that, then they give themselves very little uh, room for maneuver. So um, that's probably a not a red flag, but I'd say there's something to be be careful of if if someone has just got one approach and they're um, very fixated on that. Absolutely. Okay, um, we're coming short on time, so I'll just uh, get through these last couple of questions, if that's okay, Brad. I think this one um, you kind of covered, but I'll uh, I'll ask it anyway because it's it's slightly different. Um, so, how do you work with a client who might reject your uh, beliefs or your practices on certain ideas? If they aren't comfortable or have personal reason against certain training methods, do you adapt your own methods or do you uh, talk about the evidence to support your methods? Yeah, so this is, you know, th these hypotheticals uh, would depend, of course, that's kind of an it depends. So how open is that client to changing their opinion? But certainly, yes, I would try to talk to that person. The first thing I would say is, if let's say you have a personal trainer client relationship or strength coach uh, client relationship, I would say you're coming to me because of my expert opinion. If you know better, why are you coming? You want to say that nicely, but uh, but in, in you know in no uncertain terms, if someone's coming to you for uh, because you're the expert, it's kind of uh, misguided to then dismiss you and say. But ultimately, it is the person's. The, the most important thing with exercise is adherence. So if you're going to turn someone off to training because they don't like something, uh, something might be better in terms of the results that they're going to get. But if they don't want to do that or they're not willing to do or whatever, 
uh, it doesn't matter how good it is if they're not going to go through it and, and it's going to turn them off. So ultimately you defer, but yes, would I try? Absolutely. And uh, I think a lot of it comes down to the communication. So if uh, you have a good communication between that person, you can at least hopefully come to a, uh, a mutual, uh, mutually agreed opinion as to how to proceed. And, and on that point, Brad, um, you mentioned like, why would a client come to an expert like yourself and then sort of be um, a bit dismissive or um, argumentative? Do you, have you ever had any cases where clients have come to you almost for validation of what they're doing? So they kind of just want you to say, yeah, that looks good. And then maybe when you have alternative suggestions, they're not as open to that as they might be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, people... Uh getting validated by an expert is something that makes people feel good and uh, getting criticized by an expert does not necessarily make them feel good, but it depends how you go about yeah. making criticism. One thing that I, I mean, there's a lot that I've learned over my years. Uh, I was a practitioner as a personal trainer for many years before I found my new life. Uh, so in my old life as a personal trainer, uh, I did a lot of things wrong when I was first starting. I had no real guidelines, you know, no real uh, gauge as to how to proceed. There was not the evidence. That this is going back to the 90s and early 2000s, um, where the internet was not what it is now for, you know, the ability to get advice. And yeah, I would say that I was certainly, uh, I made mistakes. And you, I learned over time the... Uh, how to communicate better and to, I think you get much better results when you can sure. tactfully uh, tell someone, you know, what you think might improve, how they might improve. That's, a, that's an interesting example as well, because you've merged all of the three tenets of evidence-based practice there. So you, you mentioned back in the day, there was less evidence. You also had less experience, which is the mm -hmm. other side. And then we're talking about a client who has certain preferences and that sort of, sort of like ties all those in together and, that's exactly how how it should be. It's neither focusing on one or the other in isolation. It's uh, uh, all in three in combination. Yep. Okay, f uh, final question then, because I, I know you've got to shoot off. And um, this one has come from Milan, and he says, uh, I find some research papers very interesting, but difficult to understand. Is it important, and this kind of goes back to our previous discussion, he says, is it important to understand and explain to clients why something works physiologically if the research shows that it does work. For example, um, lifting weights for muscle hypertrophy, um, do the clients need to know why it works? I would say no. As a matter of fact, so one of the things that kind of uh, drove me to becoming an educator is because most clients don't give a crap about uh, why I, I wanted to, I, I was all about, you know, yeah, hey, check this out. This is, and the client's just, I just want to get results. Just show me what I'm supposed to be doing. I, so my opinion there is if a client wants to know, then yeah, absolutely. You should not only explain it to them, but be able to explain it to them properly. But uh, if their goal is just to get results, no, I, I don't think it's necessary for uh, someone to know why they are, they're doing something unless they want to. But I suppose um, for the uh, from the trainer's perspective, it's useful to have that explanation sort of in your bank in case someone a client does want to know and it also um demonstrates kind of the evidence behind what you're doing and instills some confidence in that practice yeah i think a lot of times uh trainers want to impress the client with their knowledge but a lot of times clients don't care about being impressed so you got to know your client but as you said the most important thing is that the the trainer or the uh, professional understands the science and if needed is able first of all they understand it so they know how to program properly they're able to use that in their program design as well as the fact they're able to explain it in clear terms if asked sure cool well um i appreciate you you've got to shoot off now brad so um i'm glad we managed to get through most of the questions Really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to do this. And uh, I'm sure everyone has learned a lot and found it enjoyable. So uh, just like to say uh, thanks again for your time. Um, it was really good of you. My pleasure, Paul, and thank you. Cool. I'll catch you soon then, Brad. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Speak Ciao. Soon. Bye.